It's hard to believe that this is the Hollow Suite. The setting is much like the graphics you have scanned in the library from those planets more interesting in their climatic diversity. From the scenic jutting peaks, soft hills, and lake in the conjured distance to the lush, pixelized growth of trees, flowers, and grass in the foreground, the hollow deck has that sublime park-like perfection. Unfortunately, its serene beauty is sadly negated by the headstones and the solemn event about to occur, the laying to rest of your rescuer and true friend, Stellar Santiago. You are feeling as you have never felt before, perhaps helped along by the relatively short stints aboard the various ships, as well as all too brief friendships, you've been spared the emotional devastation of true loss by lack of attachment. This, however, is a different feeling, far different from anything you've ever experienced. You can't help but wonder how you'd act towards Stellar given a second chance, but you know that can never happen. She gave her life for you, and you will never be able to thank her. Enough smarm already. Let's funeral! Ladies and or gentlemen, we assemble here today to honor the memory of a former crewmate, Lieutenant First Class Stella Santiago. Her unfortunate death takes place in the shadow of a new community, the dawning of a new life for the aged of our galaxy. Although death is never easy to accept, we must remember that the tragic accident which took her from our midst occurred while she was on duty. If a member of StarCon must perish for some reason, there is no more honorable way. It is part of the oath we recite and take to heart when we pledge our allegiance. I believe her friend, Janitor Second Class Roger Wilco, has a few words he'd like to say. Mr. Wilco? This setting is idyllic. You know in a place deep inside of you, despite your emotional thickness, that this is what Stellar would have wanted. The sky is the proverbial azure that so many humans find soothing and reminiscent of home. Unless, of course, they're from LA or Denver. Visually perfect trees, described by some higher handicap types as golf ball trajectory adjusters, add a beauty and serenity to the setting. Yes, Stellar would have liked this, especially if she weren't the center of attention. It's your average, everyday hollow chaplain. Stunningly real, don't you think? Not too appropriate, even for you. That's the holographic grave digger. His program certainly is low key. Pay no attention to them. They're just extras we hired to fill the room. Come on, you know him. That's Dorf, the deep ship's nearsighted and relatively clueless security chief. This is the standard compost. It's the only other thing that detracts from the nearly perfect scene before your eyes. You would leave Stellar's funeral? This is the control panel for the hollow suite from which this setting was recreated. Wouldn't it be fun to see everyone's reactions if you turned off the program? You quickly lose the thought and remember Stellar. This is the intake exhaust tube for the on-ship transporter. This is what sucks you here and there. This is the tube bottom. The sensor pad feels warm and smooth, like a laminated baby's bottom. Jeez, the coffin. The true gravity of Stellar's death hits you in the uh, stomach, nearly making you physically ill. It's really true. No, that's more than you're up to at this time. All you really want to touch is the spleen of whoever did this to Stellar. Egad, can you really be thinking that? Uh... 
I only knew Stellar for a short time. I wish I uh, could have gotten to know her much, uh, much uh, better. To have had a deeper understanding of this uh, person. I, I was proud to have called friend. Of my friend, I can only say this. Of all the souls I have encountered in my cleaning, hers were the most scuff resistant. This is the hollow joint. There are the usual compost and transport tubes as in all other ship locations. There is a special control panel near those. Otherwise, the room is nearly devoid of features. The truly unique thing about this room is its ability to be programmed to replicate just about any setting and situation. It is often used for training as well as for periods of recreation by the crew. The walls have a flat, nondescript finish. Very deceiving when you consider what this room is capable of. The floor is featureless. Those little red things are transporter station status lights. You have no idea what they mean. They always look that way. That's the in-ship transport tube for this room. You've been hurled through it more times than you'd care to think about. The only time you can touch that is when you're passing through it. It's the pad the ship's transport system uses as a target when spewing transportees to their appropriate destinations. These are the holodeck programming controls. Those buttons seem to be self-explanatory. I wonder what they do. As elsewhere, this room is equipped with a compost. The transport room is a very important place aboard any Starcon ship, and for safety reasons, tends to be one of the cleanest. You ought to know. Due to its proximity within the ship, many of the superstructure elements of deep ship pass through the transport chamber. You'll probably remember this quite well since abandoning, er, uh, escaping from dangerous situations. After all, it is your forte. The transport alcove contains transport pads for up to five crew members and or supplies. Above each is a subatomic particle scanner. It's called a superstructure. You hardly fit the description of someone who could have the slightest effect on it. Besides, you don't want to mess with something that maintains the structural integrity of the ship. But then it is you we're talking about here. Nonetheless, pay no more attention to it. Any unassimilated subatomic particles from the transport process are deposited here. This helps to keep the transporter pads dust-free. And don't worry, they almost never have any problems with important parts not making it through the transport process properly. You give it a tap, but nothing happens. It's a flux condenser. You haven't a clue what it does, but it looks kind of cool. It's a sealed component. The seal would not be necessary were it not for curious losers like yourself. 
No one's perfect. If you were able to see slightly higher than the graphic allows, you'd notice that the pipes mysteriously end, as if an error had been made in the ship's design. They're useless to you as well as to the ship. This is the transporter control panel. The droid assigned here handles all transport duties from this station. I wouldn't try that if I were you. He may not react too favorably. This droid is the teleporter station technician. It's all business. It's tolerant of humans to a point. You'd best leave it alone and get back to business. It's interested only in its job. It has not one speck of personality. In fact, it could make you look like the life of any party. is Eight Rear, the ship's lounge. Here crew members come to relax, drink, eat, converse, party, hit on each other, brawl, hurl, pass out, and intrude on each other's personal space. You can't detach that without a Zyquest torque phase shifter. And who'd want to anyway? Nah, I get tired of talking to the same old group of losers. This sign and the menu screen attached indicate that this is a Mr. Soylent food replicator. It makes you wonder what kind of kickback Starcon is receiving for this blatant plug. A friendly Mr. Soylent food replicator stands in wait to serve anyone who wants a snack. Technically, these aren't replicators. They're wormholes into the restaurant universe. But the food still tastes replicated because the chefs in the restaurant universe are mostly ex-monolith burger employees and know nothing about food. Replicator. Replicator. Make me something to eat. Nothing happens. This is no fairy tale. This is the screen used to display the numbers as you enter them. This world's a great big ball of dirt with 50 billion souls Who like to sit around and veg down in the dark like moles But me, I'm just the kind of girl who loves the open air And bits of unburned hydrocarbons blowing through my hair the soil is clear, at last it's here with clearly better taste. Less people too, like me and you, and less sweet processed waste. More hearty crunch for snacks or lunch, it's crystal clear to see. New soil and clear, the last frontier for folks like you and me. New soil and clear, clearly less people, clearly more taste. This is the replicator hatch, a sliding door behind which is hidden the vortex resonance coils and the molecular soilentization generator. You shouldn't try to open this door by tugging on it. You'll strip the gears just like you did to the replicator in your quarters. Open up in there. The Plastosaran keyboard overlay is puncture-proof and liquid-proof. It's a button with a number on it. The button has a star on it. It's supposed to be a last food redial, but it never works correctly. This button has a period on it. It's a backspace key so that you can change your mind before you enter a number into the replicator. It's also the key you use most frequently. This is the enter button also known as the return key. 
It is the button you press to indicate that you have concluded the process of entering alphanumeric information into the display from the console. There, did we clear that up? This access panel contains the food replicators. Um, uh, the thing that keeps the, uh, uh, well, it's got this lever with this other thing connected to it. Uh, uh, anyway, it keeps the replicator from getting the, um, uh, um, uh, never mind. Hmm, something tells me you're thinking of the demo. Demo? Yeah, you remember, the demo that had more version numbers than the game? Uh, yeah, that demo. You want this stuff? Maybe we should relegate the Roger Wilco character to demo-only status for the next game. You did have a brother, didn't you? Perhaps his IQ broke double digits. I don't think I actually want that stuff. Never mind. <laughs> These pillars stretch three decks up to the high vaulted ceiling of eight rear. Your neck bones grind unpleasantly as you look up at the top of the pillars. Ouch! It's hard, cool, and round, and seems to be doing a fine job of supporting the weight of the ceiling. It's like talking to the wall, only rounder. A peaceful panorama of light, color, and limitless black space drifts quietly by the window. The infinite flow and ebb of matter and energy dancing around itself in a never-ending light show of creation. I want to see something blow up! The quadruple-thick plasto-steel window is cold to the touch. You give the window a lick and a promise. The ambient light in eight rear is soft and diffused, and the light fixtures blend in with the decor to a fairly well. They're too high overhead to reach. In any event, you've managed to overcome your arboreal tendencies and are now perfectly content to live on land. Even standing on tiptoe, your tongue isn't quite long enough. This view screen lets eight rear patrons watch the subspace transmissions of Major League Hairball games, Monday Night Bunion Ball, and the occasional pay-per-view or rat fights. You lick a little dust off the screen. Mmm, tangy. The anti-grav tables are specially designed to compensate for the ship's motions, minimizing drink spills while under enemy attack. Now you can drink an alien secretion during a hull breach and still not spill a drop. Yes, your eyeballs will implode within 2.3 seconds, but if and when you make it back from sickbay, your drink will still be there waiting for you. There's nothing on the table to take. Sorry, this isn't your station. The anti-grav seats make sure you're always the proper distance from the table and that you're never short of leg room. Under normal circumstances, such as while you're supposed to be working, you'd feel free to sit down and drink and eat to your heart's content. But duty calls. Once again, you waste time talking to invisible people. And once again, you're terribly offended that they do not reply. An unusual plant specimen that someone left behind, it appears to be thriving here. Perhaps it prefers beer and popcorn to fertilizer and you grow it lamps. Wow, this guy's really pounding down the popcorn. If he keeps it up at this rate, an intervention may be called for. Now this guy is a cool one. He's slamming brews like many of the folks on the Space Quest team are going to do once they ship this chart buster. 
and we thought the Elvis 1987 poster in our office was tasteless. Eating, drinking, and looking at the stars sounds like something you'd do on a date, especially since you're usually alone. This poor slob is trying to impress the two women he's sitting near by showing them how much he can drink. Yeah, that's always a sure way to impress the babes. Yeah, just walk over and feel them up. I'm sure they'll appreciate it. And we're sure you'll enjoy it when you're the recipient of some nice phaser blast ventilation. Don't interrupt them. They're on break. Besides, you stand less of a chance of being insulted or shot down. A guy can only take so much of that. like you have a message waiting for you. Hmm. Wow, a message for me. I must be getting popular. I wonder what it is. Roger, help me. I only have a moment. They faked. Stellar, what happened? The picture's gone. You're alive? This is the bridge, the very nerve center of the SCS Deep Ship 86. The enormous deep ship cost millions of buckazoids to build, stretches on and on seemingly without end, and limps along at a snail's pace. Sort of like the first Star Trek movie. Gee, for a transwarp class starship, this thing sure feels like it's built from particle board. Hey, nice scenery. That's Commander Kielbasa's command center. No, wait, it's his scratching post. No, it's his command center. Scratching post. Wait, kids, don't fight. It's both. Feels plush and comfy. Maybe if you get to be a captain again someday, you'll get a nice scratching post command center like this one. Yeah, and you'll be on the cover of JQ. All fleas, abandon ship. All fleas, abandon ship! With these controls, Commander Kielbasa can adjust the elevation, tilt, rotation, and firmness level of his command center. And if you put in a quarter, it'll massage 320 different acupressure points. Yeah, you rearrange the commander's chair and he'll rearrange you. Rotate 60 degrees. Tilt forward 22 degrees. Hard to starboard. Evasive maneuvers. Apparently the command center only responds to kill bosses commands. It's Commander Kielbasa's kitty litter box. This is where he makes most of his best command decisions. Not to mention all of his log entries. Not on a bet. Sorry, you're not authorized to contribute to the captain's log. That's the schematic diagram of Deep Ship 86. This is the engineering station where the power grids and engines are constantly monitored to make sure they're within Starcon spec. Or at least somewhere around a point close to an approximation of the same general idea of Starcon spec. Mm -hmm. 
Occupado. The engineering station is set to listen to voice commands from authorized personnel only, and you are as unauthorized as can be. This is the communication station. All intraship, ship to ship, and ship to surface communications are routed through this terminal. Except when the communications officer is too busy leaving juvenile, my M5 Multitronic unit is more powerful than your old Daystrom laptop messages on Interdot. Don't mess with the communications post until you've learned basic punctuation. Hear ye, hear ye. We at StarCon have made a dreadful mistake. Janitor Second Class Roger Wilco is now Commander. Nice try, only you forgot to push the yellow button. Lucky for you, although it's hard to get busted down any lower than you already are. That's the communication officer. With these controls, Commander Kielbasa can override navigational subsystems, access ship-wide computer functions, perform sensor sweeps, and get to level six of Super Nunzio World. What are you going to do, play more dull combat? Computer, what's the airspeed velocity of a laden swallow? African or European? I don't know. Hey, 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 enough of that. Let's move on. This is the science station, housing the advanced sensor systems, extended computer reference modules, and pattern detectors. You activate the level one pattern detector. Hmm, game number one in a series sells 50,000 copies. Game number two in the series sells 100,000 copies. Game number three sells 150,000 copies. Game number four sells 200,000 copies. Game number five sells 250,000 copies. You're detecting a definite pattern here. This science station is a ready source of information on just about any topic in the universe. Thus, you are absolutely incapable of carrying on an intelligent conversation with it. This station houses the security and tactical arrays. You perform a quick structural integrity scan, followed by a sweep for subspace particle emissions, and finish with a level three diagnostic. I like pushing the green button best. The engineering and tactical displays respond to intelligent voice commands. Yes, you're out of luck. That's Commander Kielbasa, dummy. That wouldn't prove fulfilling. Commander Kielbasa, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I've just received a distress message on my compost. And it was from Stellar. Wilco, have you been whiffing cleaning fluid again? I'm absolutely as sane as I've ever been. She's being held on Delta Berksilon by Sharpay. Wilco, do you realize how irrational that sounds? We buried Stellar. You were there. Maybe you need a rest. Take a couple of hours off. Sir? We'll go. We have our orders from Starcon, and we'll be carrying them out. Drop it, Janitor. Leave the bridge now, Wilco. I've made my decision. Janitor Wilco, you must have something to clean up somewhere. Make yourself scarce. We're very busy up here.
This is the entrance to the shuttle bay. Since the shuttle bay is a hazardous area, and since visiting dignitaries often pass through these doors, security is extremely tight here. It feels really swank. Shh! This is a high security area. What were you thinking? This massive door leads to the shuttle bay. Since the shuttle bay is completely depressurized every time a shuttle lands or takes off, this door must be incredibly thick and impenetrable. Not unlike you. No amount of brute strength can pry these doors apart, even if you had some. Open the shuttle bay doors, Hal. He insists on slipping that line in somewhere in every sequel. This handy-dandy scrolling board announces incoming and outgoing shuttles. During the quieter stretches, it's also used to display the scores when they hold donkey basketball games in the shuttle bay. No can do. It's one of two buttons you must push simultaneously to open the shuttle bay door. That's Chesbro, one of the shuttle bay guards. An interesting thought, but you wouldn't want to give him the wrong idea about your intentions. You consider saying hi until you remember how dedicated he is to his job, and you wouldn't want him to get in trouble for slacking off while on duty. I wonder why you don't worry about that for yourself. Magnum Opus belongs to an elite Starcon fighting forces called the Flying Flingers, FF for short. I really don't think that's a good idea. He's not the touchy-feely type. Magnum doesn't talk. He fancies himself to be like one of those Buckingham Palace types. A nice fatty donut. Magnum will probably scarf this down. After all, he needs to maintain his boyish tub of guts figure. looking very much like Girl Scouts are badgering the poor alien-looking guy they're sitting with. They must be trying to unload more of those damn cookies. It's your old non-organic friend, Circuit Sydney. Sure, it's hard not to want to stroke Sydney's buffed exterior, but that would be impolite. Hello, Roger. Please join me in consuming something. Thanks, Sydney. You seem uptight. Say what? Upright? What are you talking about, Sydney? Uptight was the word. Perhaps that is too archaic a reference for you. It would have been more effective to say that you seem concerned. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I do have a thing or two. Uh, well, at least something on my mind. I am sorry to hear this. I hope your concerns are soon alleviated. Thanks, Sid. I do have to come up with some solutions. Sidney, I have a favor I'd like to ask of you. Flame away, Roger. You know I'd give you my right appendage if you needed it. Funny you should say that, Sidney. I kind of have this situation where that very item could come in handy. Really? Well, I was merely saying that, uh, metaphorically. You really are a great friend, Sidney. That'll come in real handy. I can't thank you enough, Sidney. Well, if you really are seriously in need of it, I suppose I could lend it to you. You will get it right back to me, won't you, Roger? Oh, yeah. You bet your nut flanges, Sidney.
Sydney, I kind of need another favor. I need one of your eyes. Pardon me, Roger. For a second, I thought you said you also wanted one of my eyes. I must have my auditory circuits diagnosed. Well, actually, Sydney, I, I could use one of your eyes. Are you certain, Roger? Well, I guess if you really need it. Oh, I do. I really do, Sydney. You're a mechanized lifesaver. You will return them soon, right, Roger? Oh, uh, of course, Sydney. Real soon. Listen, I've got a couple of things I've got to attend to. I'll see you soon. Uh, thanks, Sydney. As long as you say it will be soon, Roger. Oh, yeah. Uh, see you soon, Sydney. Roger, are you here to return my structural loans? Soon, Sydney. Soon. Well, I do hope it's soon. People are starting to look at me in a strange manner. You got it, Sydney. I'll be back soon. These are the holodeck programming controls. No real mystery as to what this does. At least there'd better not be. You are looking at two computer screens. Yes, two. The computer screen of your wimpy PC and the screen of our far superior Hollow Cabana that can render your PC worthless. This is one of the number keys, as indicated by the strategically placed numbers on it. I can see where you'd be confused. This clears the previous entry. This deletes the entry. This begins execution of your entry. Welcome to Hollow Suite Program 5551212, The Volga Nerve Pinch. Despite our reputation for being pacifists, we Volgas have developed an extremely practical martial arts technique used mainly for defensive purposes. It is called the Volga Nerve Pinch. This is a tactile oral maneuver in which the applier pinches the bundle of nerve fibers at the base of the neck while whispering into the victim's ear dialogue from either Tango and Cash or Hudson Hawk. 
This particular combination of nerve stimuli and loss of cerebral control due to the torturous mantra of movie dialogue results in a searing flash of pain and then unconsciousness. In effect, it is similar to a temporary orally induced robotomy. Victims are soon rendered unconscious for several hours. When they awaken, they will remember nothing of how they came to be unconscious, if they are extremely lucky. I shall demonstrate on my most eager volunteer. You will please to pay attention. Address the subject in this manner. Please to notice the location of my hand as I begin the narcotic chant of cinematic morphine. He mutters something thankfully unintelligible into the ear of the volunteer. Oh, thank you, sir. Maybe you can fetch me up with your sister. I have to follow up to her. Oh, oh, oh. We're going to have margaritas together. Oh, that's what let's get. Oh, oh, oh. We have fun. Oh, get a hubba hubba going in the way. And I used to like that. Oh, oh, oh. So, as you can see, it is very effective. If you can apply a proper grip to the neck, it will disable 9 out of 10 neck-bearing species. This completes our program. Thank you very Gotcha with my fingers in your Kurt Russell. Now you can't get away. Gotcha now that you've got a hard to believe this is a real job. To win. Oh my god. So how come you're not going down? I got you with your mumble jumbo and your hobbit chubby. Oh boy. I, uh, I, if I only could, I would. Jeez. If you, why don't you step outside, pal? I got you with this. And, uh, mm, I think I broke a fingernail here. setting, it looks like freedom. Home sweet home, until you figure out how to get out of here and away from that nearsighted security guard. Enjoy, Mr. Wilco! Oh, the cushy life will be a vague memory after you are sent to one of the labor camps on Daventry 8. As you run your hand over the graffiti-covered bare plastostone walls of the cell, you wonder why nobody ever cleans this place. Who goes there? Oh, it's me. Gazing out the window reminds you of a legendary prisoner named the Birdman of Deep Ship 12, who raised homing pigeons in his cell for months. He then hatched a scheme in which he'd write notes and attach them to the pigeons and send the pigeons out the window in search of help. Naturally, the birds would immediately explode upon being released into outer space. But he never gave up. When he was released, he was heavily recruited by SOL Incorporated. Enjoy. I'll be back to pick up the cart. With the force field on, I trust you won't be going anywhere. <clears throat> I have some matters to attend to now. 
It's a hovercraft for transporting replicated food. In desperation, you attempt to bend the bars, roll the toilet paper out the windows, slide down the roll, and escape. Unfortunately, there are several flaws in this plan. You stupidly try to spit out the window, completely forgetting that there's quintuple thick Dynaplane glass in front of these bars. The bars are just there for atmosphere. This is now your bed. Suddenly you find yourself wondering what kind of festering, slimy, pus-laden criminals have sat on this very bed and what they've left behind. Don't talk to the bed. You'll get down in the mouth. From where you're sitting, it looks like freedom. That's an interesting idea. Even Dorf would notice that something would be missing where there were two things, the cart and you. If you look at it, it's a sink. If you smell it, it's a toilet. Well, let's just look at it. Why doesn't this darn sink work? What's wrong with this ship, anyway? Uh, prisoners have rights, too, you know. This is an outrage. This treatment is inhumane. I'm sorry, but I'm peeved. Sorry I lost control like that. I'm better now. Yuck. No pine scent here. It looks like a John. Note, we would like to apologize to all those members of the audience named John, who might have been offended by the preceding message. It's not our fault that your parents named you after a bathroom fixture. This is some very fine food, uh, whatever it is. <laughs> I'm sure you'll find it quite to your liking. Heck, it's probably better than what they feed you janitors. <laughs> Live it up! <laughs> oh, that darn light needs to be amplified. I need to contact maintenance. While that's an interesting idea, even Dorf would notice that something would be missing where there were two things, the cart and you. I don't have to go right now. I went just before you started playing. You don't need a drink right now, you old space dog. It's one of the interestingly shaped pastries you took from the food cart. Cool, Bobbit kebabs. They whip up some interesting food items in this joint. It's the donut you filched from the food cart. It's a plate of grill hair spaghetti. It's a nice round melon. I remember what this is. It's a rack of Orat. Haven't seen this stuff since Space Quest One. It's a tuberous growth of some sort from the food cart. These look like something they cleave from the side of Yoda's head. Now it has some cool ears. That's an interesting idea. It might have some potential. The rack of a rat adds a nice touch.
An interesting idea. Something's starting to take shape. What are you up to, Roger? A touchment of that adds something more to your work in progress. How creative. That's a nice touch. Something seems to be taking shape here. I see you have a visitor. I'll leave you two alone, but you know the rules. Ten more minutes and they have to leave. Yikes, it's a good thing Dorf's so vain about wearing his prescribed much thicker glasses. That was too close. I nearly dampened an undergarment. Nice work. Sometimes you actually surprise me. This is the Brig area, where transgressors are placed for punishment and supposedly rehabilitation. In order to strike fear into the hearts of evildoers, the cells are labeled 105 and 106. Actually, these are the only two cells aboard the ship. But the subtlety is usually lost on these intergalactic criminal types. The brig is the most solidly built room on board. You marvel at how much more handsome this prisoner looks compared to the last one. Nice. He's having enough trouble just maintaining his species. I hardly think he's going to be paying much attention to, much less understanding, you. The bed now resembles a buffet table. Hey, there's someone in your spot. Inside this cell is the creature from the Ego, a bizarre invisible monster caught on Rialto 4. It's violent, brutal, bloodthirsty, and is a sucker for insincere flattery. Provided you could get your arm through the force field, which you can't, the creature from the ego would nip it off at the shoulder and you'd die horribly in a puddle of gore as the blood fountain from the gaping wound. Yeah, and we know exactly what you're thinking. Awesome, let's see it. Hey, handsome. Let's see that pretty little face. Impressive. It's a plain quadrofull cot. You don't get those nice shimmery sheets when you're in the brig. With the force field in place, you can't reach anything in that cell without demolecularizing your arm, which is a trip and a half, but you've kind of grown attached to it. Don't talk to the bed. You'll get down in the mouth. Wow, you can see your house from here. Nobody out there can hear you from here. This is a dispenser that releases a steady stream of dehydrogen oxide, a colorless limpid liquid compound that acts as a solvent and keeps bodily tissues from dehydrating. Don't talk with your mouth open. This is a receptacle for digestive byproducts, which are then briefly churned with dihydrogen oxide and then transported under pressure into the tanks in the replicator's subprocessing unit. Yes, provided you could get past both the force field and the creature from the ego, you could easily stick your head in the bowl and talk like Darth Vader. But it's not really worth the loss of life. 
This is a standard trans-warp class Starship food replicator, where the Starcon elite meet to eat. This sensor pad controls the force field grid for cell 105. This sensor pad controls the force field grid for cell 106. Now there's a real bright idea, but then perhaps you deserve the consequences. If the force field were turned off, you'd be the only one to suffer the consequences. In the event that someone might be looking over your shoulder, we'll save your embarrassment for another time. Oh no, I'm not going in there again. Hey, uh, Mr. Computer, release the force field, would you? First, the grid controls don't respond to voice commands. Second, it's a little objectionable to assign sexual identity to the computer, don't you think? Sorry, I forgot who I was talking to. What did you expect him to do? He helped you, and it's time for you to move along. We have adventuring to do. It's a cabinet. It's a bottle of morphine. thinking. My, this guy would give Sybil a run for her money. Oh boy, I got you with my fingers in your Kurt Russell. Now you can't get away. I got you now that you've got a hard to believe this is a real job. To win. Oh my god. So. Smooth move, you've got his key ring. It's a key with a little button thingy attached to it. 
The shuttle's alarm is now deactivated. It's a bottle of morphine, which you thought was actually morphine. Die. It's the right arm circuit Sydney was so kind to loan you. 